and then the, the people in the kitchen. This is the educational part of the evening. Okay. Uh, okay. Here we go. So, right, Benjis. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Um, critical thinking is a collaborative project, educational project, and the idea was to try and make sense of the world. And we bring, we, there's a group of individuals in London that we've been communicating with groups and individuals around the world, and we've been drawing on sources, both historic and contemporary, to try and understand how the world works. And you can boil it down to four questions. Who rules? How do they get their power? How do they exercise their power? And how do we take it away from them? And that's essentially one that, and what I'm going to go through tonight is pretty high level. Uh, there's a lot of detail behind it, which I'm not going to go into. But you're very welcome to come along to Critical Thinking and learn more, or go to the website, because there's a lot of material that sits behind this. So if I could ask my attractive assistant to put up the next slide. So we, we go, we, along oh, the oh. Way, <laughs> ah. Bad idea. <laughs> but it'll do, don't worry. Okay. Um, I, said, I said to Eddie, I normally do these things with a laptop and projection. I said, can we do a laptop projection? He said, no, but I've got a brilliant projector. <laughs> so this is it. Um, but that's my fault, because I didn't understand. Um, so we, one of the things that we did is we looked at systems thinking. And you sit, somebody at UCL gave us a workshop on the systems thinking. And basically, the world, our political economy, is a big system. Now, what you can't see at the top is, <laughs> is, is the word structural elite. And that's the name we've given to this small cabal that basically rule the world. And, the, and what gives them their power is the wealth that is extracted. You can read this. Seven billion people and the wealth derived from labor on the earth. So all the wealth is created, and it's sucked up in the form of rents, taxes, and debt interest. And it filters into the ruling elite at the top. And here, you won't be able to see, are the levers of power. And the levers of power are politics and economics, principally. Um, and the power that they get from economics comes from control of land, money, and labor. And there's, there's so much material out to to back this up, that it, it's not really disputable if you look into it deeply. And using these leaders of power, which include, and I've got a good acronym for you, who knows what MIMAC is? M-I-M-A-C. Military, Industrial, Media, Academic Complex. And that basically is controlled as one of the leaders of power that foments war. This says war. Ecocide and uh, something else. Oppression, that'll do. Inequality and oppression. Division. So basically, these leaves of power for the division and the problems that we have. And this is the way the system works. So you may ask yourselves, who are these people at the top? And I'm going to show you another useless slide. <laughs> yeah. Which? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. They've, they've got it. Your slides. So they hide themselves. Great job. <laughs> can we do this another way? No, we can't. No, it's all right. I'll talk you through it. In the middle, there's a big red blob. There's a big red blob, and this is basically the oh, oh. The, oh. 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 Sorry. the structural elite, and basically the the dominant members of this elite are banking families, so there are eight banking families, there's ro European royalty, there's the super rich, and there are what we would describe as political and economic predators, so the likes of Henry Kissinger and uh, a big new Brzezinski and people like that, uh, and the super rich, the sort of Google moguls and the others. And they control all of the things in this second layer, which you cannot see either, which I can't remember off the top of my head, which is probably a mercy to most of you. But it's, it's the sort of the military, it's the, the media, it's academia, it's all the various ideologies that think, they... Think tanks, oh, build a boat, US empire. Go and let Gary in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <Walk this way. laughs> Um, 
And basically what the outer ring is, is actually a summary of all the wars that we've seen in the last uh, 15 years, the wars of the 21st century, which essentially were kicked off by 9-11 and the invasion of Afghanistan. And if you don't understand what happened on 9-11, you cannot make sense of any of the wars of the 21st century, because the main objective is perpetual war of itself, as in Orwell's 1984. And once you understand that 9-11 is effectively a false flag operation, and then there are a whole range of other false flag op operations that follow beyond that. The downing of the MH17 to implicate Russia was clearly, from all the evidence that is available, not available from the media, but for those prepared to dig, all the evidence suggests it was conducted by the, the illegal or imposed Ukraine government. Um, and there are many more examples, but I don't want to go in that in great detail. Detail. The next picture, which you may or may not be able to see. <laughs> is this a cartoon? Uh, Let's have a look. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. This sorry, is sorry. A, a Martin Rousen cartoon um, of Bilderberg 2013. Now, when I first went to Occupy and started talking about the banking system, and people would talk about Bilderberg, I wouldn't engage because it was regarded as a conspiracy theory and wasn't acceptable in polite company. 2013, when they did Bilderberg at Watford, basically it hit the mainstream media. Michael Mitchell was interviewed on Sky News, at, out, not at the meeting, but outside, at the protest outside, which was quite well attended. I think about 3,000 people were there over the three days. Uh, and what you'll see a few of the characters who are, this is G4S, who did all the security, and they're walking over this bridge into this sort of ivory tower where the meetings are held away from the public gaze. And if you don't know about Bilderberg, I would urge you to, to go and dig a little, because it's been, it's been an annual event for the last 60 years, 1954 they started. They are secretive, and it's where the agenda for the world is set. Um, and Bilderberg, Last year was in Copenhagen, and before any politician, and today is about, you know, is, is your vote worth anything? Any politician who wants to get into power, um, a high position of power, has to go and bend the knee at uh, Bilderberg. So the likes of Obama, Blair, uh, Cameron, most recently Ed Balls has been there. Is he the coming man? Uh, George Osborne has been there, and although there is an obligation to declare admit such meetings, uh, he's never declared it in his uh, official register of interest. So, apart from all the wars and the destruction, can we have the next one? Um, there is, of course, what, what, um, what impacts most people the most immediately, particularly in this country, is the state of the economy and the effect it has on an increasing proportion of the population. So this guy, he says, I work 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, to live below 25% below the poverty line. Not everyone at the food bank is unemployed. Clearly we have economic madness. Uh, and this, this system, and I could go into a big economic argument, but somebody warned me not to be too boring, and I've lost where he was. Um, but, he said, is this going to be long and boring? And I said, I'm sure it is, but I won't take you there. But essentially, it's the control of land, interest on money, and the fact that the means to life is withheld from each of us that lies at the principal problems of our economy. You can listen to all the economists in the world, and most of them have been educated according to a system that is controlled by those that the system serves. So they don't understand fundamental natural law and basic economics. They don't understand the importance of land. They don't understand the, the, the malign, malicious, abusive, destructive nature of interest. And our economic system demands exponential growth in a finite world. It's not sustainable mathematically, it's not sustainable socially, and it's not sustainable environmentally. And I work in a city um, and I'm just waiting for the next crash because it is inevitable and the more liquidity they pump, on, 
pumped into the system to stave off the inevitable, the bigger that crash is going to be, and it's going to be nasty. In the UK, we only have three days supply of food. If everything shut down, three days is the maximum supply of food we have available in this country. So we need to be much more self-reliant as communities. Um, but I didn't want to turn this into a very dismal thing. Let's, let's move on. But there is hope. And I, I have great optimism. And one of the reasons I have great optimism is because we can communicate and learn from each other on a scale that is unprecedented. No other generation has had this opportunity. And one of the things that we've been working on recently at Critical Thinking is we've identified the mechanics of the system and how it works and what the problem is. But where did it come from? How did it emerge? And we came across this guy, Murray Bookchin. Hands up those who've heard of Murray Bookchin, apart from Eddie, because... Um, oh, yeah. Um, Murray Bookchin, I would urge you to try and get hold of this book, Ecology of Freedom. It's not, a diff it's not an easy book to read. I'm, I've had it six months, I can keep thumbing through it, and I'm still trying to absorb it. But essentially, the, way, the best way I've found of describing his ideas is that Abdul Ocalan, who was head of the KPP, the Free Kur Kurdish Army, uh, who was captured or kidnapped by a Turkey and he's been languishing in jail, he read this book and he basically remodeled the KPP, which is a non hierarchical organization. And what Bookchin says is the domination of nature and people that is at the principal cause of this emergence of hierarchy. And I could go into much more depth and talk about the features of hierarchy, but it's essentially this, this domination, the institutionalized structures that make some people superior and some inferior. And it happens over gender, it happens over aggression, it happens over nature, it happens in so many facets. But I, I think this is where the future lies, in dissolution of hierarchies, to open up our society, to create cellular structures of organisation. You know, forget parliaments and representation and elections, because I don't think where that, that's where the future lies. Um, so, should we move on? And we've been working on a few ideas, and one of the ideas we had was for turning that model that we saw, where you had the structural elite, drawing up all the wealth and bearing down on, on the millions below. This is a, an attempt at an alternative. Now, what you can't see is that these, these are yellow, these arrows, and they represent money or wealth. So basically, we draw, the resource, we draw the wealth of the resources, so land, resources, all the commons. If we extract that wealth and deal with it, objectively in such a way as to, to promote, to fund public services and an unconditional citizen's income. This becomes a virtual circle with no bankers siphoning off, no elite having the opportunity to siphon off. And the power, all of these arrows represent power, and basically everything is accountable to the majority. So it, again, in cellular structures, globally, nationally, regionally, locally, parishionally, whatever. This is just a, a sort of initial working model. But I think, I think that there are opportunities for change. And, and this generation, everybody alive today, is uniquely placed to participate in what could be the transformation of our civilization from one of competition and competitive scarcity. Because the only reason we have scarcity is because of competition. If we move to a, a model that is collaborative and open, and where we're genetically wired to cooperate, it, it's the system that demands all the competition and friction, but our natural affinity is to cooperate. So this is, is doable. And this, is, this next picture, if I've got my timing right, is something that came up. We collaborate with a lot of groups, and one of the groups we collaborate is run by a chap called Peter Challen, who's written one of these things around here who's an, an aging cleric, I think he's in his 80s, and every week he gets together, he's meeting of various groups, primarily from a sort of faith perspective, but less so these days, because they've invited people like Eddie and I in. Um, and he, sa he said at a meeting late last year, he said, I'll always remember what my dad said to me. He said, and this was near his deathbed, he said, Nothing is impossible if you don't mind who gets the credit. 
And if you think about all the problems in our society, it's all about ego and celebrity and people wanting to be recognized for what they've achieved. Frankly, I'd far rather be part of a world in which nobody knew my name, but all the things that I described were self-evident. Um, and that's it, really. So I hope I haven't bored you to death. If you want any more information, you can read this, because it's in black and white. And thank you for listening. <laughs>